Welcome to week two of our Christmas series called Chris Smith. I want to say hello to those of you joining us watching on TV or church online. If you're watching via video at our downtown campus or Amarillo campus, we're glad that you're joining us today as well. Well, earlier this week, I was tucking my daughters in bed. I love doing that. And I was telling the Jesus story. And I, my oldest is uh, McKinley. She's six. And my youngest is Kara. She's four. Tell them the Jesus story. Now, it'd be kind of cool to show it to them. And, he, and I don't know if you guys knew this, but on your uh, phone, if you have a phone or even on the computer, uh, on uversion.com, on the Uversion Bible app, that we encourage you to you know, read from and you can get the Bible reading plans and all that. There's a link on there where you can click on videos and you can watch, actually on your phone, videos from the Jesus Film Project from decades ago and then also from the Bible mini series that aired this year. And so I pulled up the Bible mini series and I clicked on the nativity scene uh, uh, option there and it shows the, the story of the birth of Jesus. And so I'm showing my, my girls and it has Mary and Joseph going into Bethlehem. They can't find a place to stay. And so they end up in a stable and then it has Mary giving birth to baby Jesus, but it doesn't show too much. Okay, it's good. And, and the girls are watching going, that's interesting. And so it shows that part. Okay, and then after it's done, and then the people come and they worship Jesus. It's great, right? I mean, some of you have seen it. It's great, great. Um, they did it well. So I finished showing them the nativity clips and I asked them, now girls, What's the point of this story you just watched? What's the point? Karis, my four-year-old. Me, 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 me. Yes, Karis, you. She said, Dad, I know the point of the story. I said, Karis, tell me the point of the story. She said, Mary pushed really hard, and then the baby came out. I said, Karis, the labor process is not the point of the story, I promise you. And how do you know what she was doing? Okay, that's weird. Okay, and so... Moving on, yeah, no, it's that Jesus came to save us from our sins. Oh yeah, daddy, I knew that. I just thought it was about the pushing too. And so it is from a four-year-old, okay? So maybe you've told your uh, kiddos the story. Hopefully you can show it to them this Christmas. It's a great time to tell people, your friends, people you work with, this incredible story about the birth of our Savior. Now, continuing in this series called Chris Smith, and basically what we've been doing, if you've been here, so we've been busting up some myths about the Christian faith commonly believed by both Christians and non-Christians alike. So last weekend was the first weekend we did myth number one. If you missed it, I think it'll surprise you, so you'll want to catch it on our website at experiencelifenow.com. But let's move on to myth number two today. I would encourage you to grab the pen that was in your chair and your program. You can flip it over. You can take some notes. You may learn some things today you didn't know. You may hear some things that surprise you. So you can write them down and share it with your friends. Here we go. Myth number two today is this. The church is a building, myth number two. You're like, what? I thought that's why they call them church buildings. Okay, what, do you, what? church is not, is the church not a building? Myth number two, the church is a building. I got good news for you today, news flash. The church is much better than just a building. It's not a building, it's much better. It's way better than that. Now let me show you where this word comes from. The first place we see it in our New Testament. It's in the Gospel of Matthew. So if you've got a Bible, you can turn there. It's Matthew uh, chapter 16. This is Matthew. I talked about Matthew last week, and he was an eyewitness of Jesus' life and his death and resurrection. And he's writing this in Greek. We have the translation in English, but he's writing in Greek. This is the first place we see this, uh, this word. Now, here in this passage, there, Jesus is asking him about this debate that was going on. People were debating who Jesus was. Different people saying different things. And so Jesus asks his disciples about, here's what Matthew records, 16, verse 13 and following. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say you're John the Baptist, like come back from the dead. Some say you're Elijah. Others say Jeremiah, one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, 
But who do you, disciples, hey, listen, 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 disciples, he's saying to his guys, hey, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, well, you're the Messiah. That's the Hebrew form of the word there. You've also in some of your translations say, you're the Christ, that's the Greek form, the Savior King we've been expecting. You're the Messiah, Peter says, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, you're blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You didn't learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you're Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, which rock? That statement, the foundations of the statement Peter just made. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Upon that rock, I'm going to build my, altogether, I'm going to build my church. First place in the New Testament where we have that word. Jesus says, I'm going to build my church. And all the powers of hell will not conquer it. So what I love about this text is Jesus is essentially predicting us. Predicting that there's going to be this church built on the foundation of he's the Christ. Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and all the powers of hell are going to try to come against it. But they're not going to be able to conquer it. Question you're probably asking, question we should be asking as we talk about this whole what is the church thing, is what does this word mean? Where did that word come from? Well, the word behind this in the Greek, Matthew, the word Matthew wrote, is the word ekklesia. It looks like this, ekklesia. And here's what it meant. It wasn't even a religious word. It just meant this. It was a gathering of people, an ekklesia was, a gathering of people with a shared interest or belief. That's what an ekklesia was. So if a, a group of people gathered together for a legal proceeding, is an ekklesia that gathered together. If soldiers gather together to go out to war, it's an ecclesia of soldiers. If a number of uh, citizens of a town come together for some meeting, it's an ecclesia of citizens. But clearly in, in this sense, Jesus was talking about those that would follow him. So he meant it in this way. The gathering would be of people that believe Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. So it's a gathering of Jesus followers that are on mission. Here's their interest. That's their belief. Here's their interest. They are on mission to change the world. Gathering of Jesus followers on mission to change the world. Jesus says he's going to build that. He said, I'm going to build an ecclesia. That's the Greek word. I'm going to build an ecclesia. Here's what I mean. And the powers of hell aren't going to be able to conquer it. Now, here's the question we should be asking. If ecclesia means gathering, then why does it say church in our Bible? If the word is ecclesia, and what we're trying to do is get a translation from the Greek that Matthew wrote in, why in English does it say church, not gathering, if gathering is what ecclesia means? That's a good question. Thank you for asking that. Thank you. That's a, you just asked a good question. And the answer to that question is going to help you understand why many people, when they think of church, they think of a building. In order to answer that question, we've got to go back about 1,700 years to the 300s A.D. Now, the first 300 years of the Christian faith from the first century to the 300s AD, the Christians in the Roman Empire, they were a persecuted minority. They were growing, but they were still a minority and they were persecuted and the Romans were furious with them and wanted to stamp out the movement. And so they were killing them, they were torturing some of them, they were crucifying others, they were chopping off some of their heads, they were burning some of them at the stake, trying to get rid of these Christians, these Christ followers. They were severely persecuted. And here's why they were persecuted. In case you're like, well, why, why, were they, why were they being persecuted? Well, because they would not declare that the Roman emperor was king. They would not say Caesar is king. Who did they think was king? Jesus. They would only say Jesus is king. The Romans wanted you to think that the Caesar, the emperor, was, was divine. They said, no, he's not. Only Jesus is divine. And because they thought only, Jesus was the only king and only Jesus was truly divine. The Romans wanted them out. They were persecuting them. First 300 years. What the Christians went through in the first 300 years was awful. If you study church history, many of them, hundreds, thousands, were murdered. That is until the 300s AD, and somebody came to power, a new emperor, and his name was Constantine. This is Constantine here. Maybe you've heard of him before. And what was so interesting about Constantine is for the first time in Roman history, a Roman emperor became a Christian. Constantine left the pagan gods of the Roman, emperor, Roman Empire and embraced Jesus as Lord. 
he became a Christian. And so he, Constantine, legalized Christianity throughout the Roman Empire. It was now legal to be a Christian. You wouldn't be killed for being a Christian. And because it was legal and because he was a Christian, it became cool to be a Christian. It became socially acceptable to be a Christian. Now, before Constantine's reign, Christians in most places met in homes for fear of persecution. They couldn't meet in buildings and stuff. They met in, in just homes. They studied the Bible together. <clears throat> they prayed together. They would go out and share their faith together. They'd baptize new converts, take the Lord's Supper together, encourage one another, and so on all in the context of homes. But when Constantine became a Christian and other high-ranking officials became Christians, they didn't think these meetings in homes were elegant enough for an emperor. They weren't elegant enough for very wealthy, high-ranking officials in the Roman Empire. So here's what they decided to do. They decided to take these Christian beliefs and combine them with some of their pagan worship practices. And they started building these lavish buildings. And in these buildings, they would have these elegant Christian services led by people in elegant clothes. And they would have these processionals and choirs. And it was very ritualistic and it was very formal. And people would come and they would sit in rows and they would listen to just a few people talk. Whereas before in homes, the Christians, they all participated. Now, in these buildings, they were merely spectators while very elegant people led these services. These buildings that the Christians met in were called basilicas. Maybe you've heard that word before. It's a Latin word. Romans called these really nice buildings basilicas. Maybe you've heard of one that was built in the 1500s, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome or Vatican City. It looks like this. Incredibly ornate, amazing, beautiful, very expensive, extremely expensive building. And this is what the Christian faith, Christianity, Christendom began to look like. Not so much these gathering and gatherings in homes anymore. Those weren't quite elegant enough. Now this, now that is elegant. Well, the Germans, they weren't Germans at the time. It was the Germanic cultures. They catch on. They're influenced by Christianity. They become Christians. They want to start building some of their own basilicas. But they don't call them basilicas. That was a Latin word used by the Romans. Here's what they call them. They call them Kirsches. It's a German word. If you know German and I just butchered your language, I apologize, okay? I looked this up in a pronunciation guide online. I think it's right, maybe, okay? But Kirsche, I think, is how you say that. And so they're building these basilica-like structures, ornate, lavish, elegant places. They call them Kirsches. And it's from the German word Kirsche that we get the English word church. See the similarities? Kirsche. It's church. So here's what's interesting. In your New Testament, when you see the word church, whereas most of your New Testament, the rest of it would be a translation from the Greek, they didn't translate the word ecclesia. They imported a German word into our language, church. Here's the problem with that. Kirsha, the German word which became church. And ecclesia, the thing that Jesus said he was going to build, are two totally different ideas. A kirsha, a basilica, is a building. It's a location. It's a place. And ecclesia, what Jesus said he was going to build, is a people that could meet anywhere. Is a gathering, like I said, of Jesus' followers on a mission to change the world. That's what, that's what Jesus was wanting to build. Very different, though, than a kirsha. You see, you could lock the doors of a kirsha. Not so with the ecclesia Jesus was trying to build. So ecclesia, because of these words, kind of lost its original meaning. And ecclesia, this time, became associated with a building. And whoever controlled the church building controlled the church. And whoever controlled the church controlled the scriptures. So much so that hundreds of years later in Europe, the Bible was literally chained to the pulpit. People didn't have one in a translation they could understand. You had like Greek manuscripts, you had the Hebrew manuscripts, and then you had a translation in Latin. A lot of people didn't know that language. 
It's chained to pulpits. The only people that had access to them are like the religious leaders, and most of them are locked up in libraries or chained to pulpits. Well, there, there were some men in the 1500s. They didn't like this very much. They were called reformers. They wanted everybody to have a Bible in a language they could understand. They didn't want the high-ranking church officials to be keeping the Bible from everybody. They moved west. They took the Hebrew Old Testament manuscripts with them, the Greek New Testament manuscripts with them, started to translate them. One guy, you've probably heard of him, was named Martin Luther. He went to Germany to where he was from, and he began to translate the scriptures into German. But there's another guy who maybe you haven't heard of that translated them into English for English-speaking people. Now, he wanted to do it in England where they spoke English, but they wouldn't let him. They did not want people to have a Bible in a language they could understand. So he moved to Germany to do the translating. And this is his name, William Tyndale. Smile, William. Good to say, okay, it's William right there, okay? And so he decided, I'm gonna translate the Greek New Testament manuscripts into English so that my people can have them in a language they can understand. This is a quote from Tyndale. This is so good. He's talking to a priest, preacher friend of his, okay, while he's doing this translation thing. It says this, when a fellow clergyman challenged Tyndale, suggesting that people might be better without the law of God, the Bible, than the law of the Pope. Like people be better without a Bible than to disobey the Pope. That's what he told Tyndale. Tyndale said, if God spares my life before many years pass, I will make it possible for a boy behind the plow to know more scripture than you do. He said, I'm gonna take this thing, I'm gonna translate it, I'm gonna get it back to my home country, I'm gonna get in everybody's hands and young boys behind a plow, they're gonna read this and preach your friend, hey, they're gonna know more than you. And that's what he did. Translates it into English in Germany. Smuggles it into England. As a result, he became a wanted criminal. What was his crime? Translating the Bible into English. Translating a Bible into a language that people could understand. Church officials came after him. Government officials came after him. It took him 10 years to find him. He's smuggling all these copies of the New Testament into his country in English. 10 years later, they find him. You know what they do with Win William Tyndale for the crime translating the Bible into English? They strangle him and burn him at the stake. How could he? It'd be better for them to not have a Bible than to disobey the Pope. But the Bible was out. People had copies in English, and they began to read them. You say, why would they do that, though, to Tyndale? Why would they kill him like that? One word, really. Control. They knew if common people got this in a translation they could understand, they would recognize that the church of the 16th century looked nothing like the church of the 1st century, and they would rebel. They would call for reform. They would call for change. They did not want people to be able to have this in England, in English, or something might happen. Another thing Tyndale did, surprised everybody, is when church officials and others got some copies of his New Testament, they got to Matthew 16 in English. And you know how Tyndale translated into English that passage that I just read to you a few minutes ago? He translated it, and Jesus said, I will build my, not church, he said, I will build my congregation and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Meaning gathering, meaning like what the word means. He was not going to translate it church because he knew the ecclesia of Jesus was not a kirsha. It was not a building. It was not confined to a basilica. It's a movement. It's a gathering of Jesus followers on mission to change the world. So he translates it congregation. And people, especially church officials, were furious. He didn't call it church, kirsha, meaning our buildings. You know, but it was because of the bravery of men like William Tyndale and Martin Luther that the meaning of ecclesia was rediscovered and the church began to spread outside of buildings once again meeting in homes and in businesses and outside in the open air because they recognized that ecclesia didn't just mean I had to go to that basilica, I had to go to that kirsha. It meant it was a gathering of Jesus followers on mission to change the world. And it began to spread 
everywhere. And many people during this time became Christians as they got a copy of this in a language they could understand. It was dangerous. This is dangerous for people to have in a language they can understand because if people read it, they apply it to their lives, it can change the whole world. And the church officials knew it. That's why they didn't want anybody to have it. Today, if you look in your New Testament in Matthew chapter 16, you saw what the word is. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that's okay. It's church and that's, that's fine. You just have to understand what it means. That it's not a kersha. That it's not a basilica. It's not a building. It's a gathering. It's a people. It's not a location. It's not a place. It's a people. A gathering of Jesus followers on mission to change the world. The church isn't a building. It's much better than a building. So when you see the word church, remember, it's not kersha. It's ecclesia. It's a gathering. It's a people. And when they're armed with God's word in a language, they can understand the world better. Watch out. Let me give you four reasons as we close that I think still many of us live like we believe the church is just a building. Four reasons. Reason number one is this. People didn't think e-life was a church until we had a building. Did you know that? Maybe some of you thought that. You know emails I got, phone calls I got? Hey, Chris, when y'all gonna become a real church? When are you going to become legit? You're just meeting in a skating rink. When are you going to become a church? How many of you guys know we were a church long before we had a building? How many of you guys know that? Yeah, we were a church long before we had a building because the church isn't a building. It's an ecclesia. It's a gathering of Jesus followers wherever they can meet, whether it's in a home or a skating rink or a renovated bus station or a metal building or a outside. It's a gathering. So we shouldn't treat the church like it's a building. A church can meet anywhere, and there's churches all around the world that don't have buildings, and they are reaching people for Christ like crazy because a church is not a kersha. It's not a building. It's much better than that. Number two, second reason I know we still believe that sometimes is people, you and me sometimes, still treat the Bible like it's chained to the pulpit. Meaning you have one in a language you can understand, and oftentimes we don't read it. You know, for centuries, people would have given their lives, people did, Tyndale, so that you could have this in a language that you could understand. First English Bible, William Tyndale, for you and me. Can you, can you imagine what he would think if we then got it and didn't read it? <laughs> if we read it and we didn't live it out? Oh, my goodness. For centuries, people wanted this so bad, and now we have it in English, and we can read it, and God can use us to change the world. But here's what we do. We treat the church like it's a building, and what we do is we come to church expecting that the pastor is going to teach us the Bible, and so there's really no reason for me to read it. And I guarantee if you come here to experience life, we teach the Bible. I will teach the Bible, but you shouldn't treat it like I'm the only one that has a copy that is chained up here. It's in your hands. You can read it, and you should judge and evaluate everything I say and everything this church does on the basis of whether or not a precedent can be found for it in Scripture. Because we don't want to go back to the time where it's just whatever that guy says, we believe it. Forget the Bible. No, 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 no. The Bible, not a man, not a church, is our authority. Don't treat it like it's chained to the pulpit. You got it in a language you can understand. Why don't you read it? People wanted to for years and they didn't have one. We got to read it. Number three, people look to pastors to go and tell people about Jesus <laughs> rather than seeing themselves as those who are supposed to go and tell. That's how you know you think the church is a building because that's what they did when the church met in a, these big basilicas. It's like, hey, Chris, we're cheering you on, buddy. Way to go change the world, man. You got this. Eli, staff, you got We're going to come and sit and watch you guys. We're going to cheer for you. We're going to clap. Y'all go change the world. But before they ever had these basilicas, when they met in homes before Constantine, everybody in that home saw themselves as a leader in the church. Everybody in that home thought that they were supposed to go and tell. It wasn't just the person that owned the home's responsibility that was supposed to go and tell. We're all Christians. We're all disciples of Jesus. We're all supposed to go and tell. But when the church became a building and the main thing churches did was just have some guy stand up here and talk to people, they thought, well, it must be his job, not mine. Wrong. That's how you know you think the church is a building. Wrong. We're all followers of Jesus. Those that have committed our lives to Jesus, we're all called to go and make disciples of all the nations, to go and tell. All of us. And number four, people think the mission of the church is to have services in a building each weekend that they can sit and watch. That's how you know you still think the church is a building. When you think that the mission is church services in a building with people sitting in chairs listening to somebody speak. Whoever said that was the mission? 
Jesus didn't say that. What did Jesus say the mission was? To go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And he said, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. That's the mission. The only reason you should have a building and sit in rows and listen to somebody is if it helps to accomplish the mission. And that's why we do that here at eLife. You might not know this, but in the early days, we didn't even have a gathering like this. We just met home to home and we thought, oh, okay, we're getting bigger. We're gonna try a gathering like this, see if it helps us to accomplish that mission. And it was, and people were coming to Christ and people were attending and they were growing spiritually. So as long as services in a building help us accomplish the go and make disciples of the nations, we'll keep doing them. But if they ever don't, if they ever become ineffective at helping us accomplish the mission, guess what we'll do? Something else. You're like, heretic. Yeah, it's because you believe church is a building. It's not. We could do this in homes, and we do. I'm talking about, talk to you about that in a second. You could do it outside. You could meet any number of places. The reason we have these buildings, we're thankful for them, is because we think so far they've been helpful in accomplishing the mission. But the building is not the mission. The mission is to make disciples. Meeting like this, gatherings on the weekends, though, can help accomplish that mission. But we've got two other things we do here that we also think are equally important. People don't treat them like they're equally important because the, the weekend's the large, most, uh, has the most people. But two other things that we think are equally important in fulfilling the mission. First is our prayer meetings. If you ever come on a weekend, or maybe you feel this way right now, and you think it's powerful, you feel like God speaks to you, can I tell you why? Number one, because Jesus is awesome. But number two, people are praying for you. Now, and they were earlier this week, Sunday night in Amarillo, Monday night, Southwest Campus, Tuesday night, downtown campus. You know why we think the weekends are even effective and people come and their lives are changed? Because people are praying. Our prayer gatherings, man, they are important to us accomplishing this mission, just like our weekends have been important to us. Third thing, weekends, prayer, groups, life transformation groups. Did you know those little ecclesias I was talking about, people met in before Constantine came to power and they had these buildings that met in homes? We do that too. Did you know that? We meet in homes too. They can multiply faster. You can get to know people better. You do life together, study the Bible together, go out and reach your friends together. We meet in homes too. It's equally important. We're banking on not just the weekend, but the weekend prayer and our LTGs to help us accomplish this mission to change the world, to make disciples of all the nations in Lubbock, in this region, Amarillo, and around the world. So if you really believe what I'm saying is true, that the church is much better than a building, then don't treat the church like it's a building just by thinking, I went to church just because I went to a weekend service. No, the mission of this church is encompassed, accomplishing that mission is encompassed by three different things we think are equally important. Weekends, groups, and prayer. And we only do three because we don't want to make it hard for people to attend all of them and do 15 or something. Just do three things. And we encourage everybody to get involved because that's how we think we're going to be most effective, not just with services on a weekend. Because the mission isn't the weekend. <laughs> the mission is to change the world and make disciples of all the nations. Make sure you don't get those confused. Because if you think the mission of the church is just to have weekend services, then you still think the church is a building, and I'm here to tell you, it's much better than that, much better. And some of you came today, you told your friends, or you'll tell your friends later, I went and I went to church today. I went to, I went to church today. Well, I want you to know, according to this definition, you're not in the church today unless you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, all of us are in a building today, but this building doesn't define us. This building isn't the church, it's the place the church meets. You're only in the church today Ecclesia, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. So make sure you're not just attending services in a building today. Make sure you're in the church. And the way you make sure you're in the church is you repent of your sin, you turn from your sin, and you turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, I commit my life to you. Save me. Rescue me. Forgive me. I can't get to heaven on my own. I'm going to go straight to hell, Jesus, without you. Would you save and rescue me? I know you can. You've promised me that you, you would. Would you do that for me? Every time his answer is absolutely yes. That's why I can. Then you can leave here for sure knowing I didn't just attend service in a building. I went to church. I was a part of the church. 
today because the church in a building it's way better than a building it's a gathering of jesus followers on a mission to change the whole world and when jesus followers are equipped with god's word the bible and we read it and we apply it to our, our lives nothing's going to be able to stop us Jesus promised that even the gates of hell will not be able to stop you. So Christians, disciples of Jesus, arm yourself with God's word and let's go out together and change the whole world. Let me pray for you. God, thank you so much for helping us rediscover the meaning of ecclesia, that it's not a building, it's not a basilica, it's not a kirsha. It's a gathering. It's a people. It's a Jesus people. Jesus followers that are on mission to change the world. God, the mission of this church is the mission of Jesus. It's not to just have services in the building. The mission of this church is to change the world. Take the good news about Jesus all across this globe. God, help us to do it. Raise up many people that will say, I'm not just going to count on the pastors to go and tell. I'm going to go and tell. I'm not just going to count on the pastors to tell me what the Bible says. I'm going to read it for myself. I'm going to live it out. And I want to be a part of changing the world too. God, we look forward to seeing what you do in the days ahead. Because we're not just a church. We're an ecclesia of Jesus. And we have a mission. And we plan to fulfill it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. For more information about our church or to watch other messages, you can go to our website at experiencelifenow.com. Let us know if we can serve you in any way, and we hope to see you real soon.